that's yeah, we'll put it in the same place. Oh, that's that's I guess that's we have all this. We have our we have this team log and everybody logs into them and just throw everything in there.
So basically, you have to go over some mechanisms building off what Earl just talked about. So before we get to that, I kind of want to talk about uh, some key things to consider when designing just anything in general. You guys might have uh, heard this as a robot designer already. But whenever you're trying to solve a problem after you've devised your strategy, don't get fixated on one solution. Don't try to just focus on that one thing or else you're establishing parameters very quickly and then you just get limited and stuck to have a tunnel phase. So don't do that. Be overnight. And try to keep your design flexible. This is especially apparent with your chassis. Um, basically the spine, the skeleton of your robot, the thing that everything sticks to. Try to keep it flexible um, because it will be subject to change. I think a couple of years ago, I think two years ago, the first year that we started, uh, we redid our robot halfway through the season. Luckily, our chassis was able to comply with that. So keep it flexible. And above all, just if you're going to do something, um, keep it simple. The simple solution is often the best one. Um, complexity is sometimes inevitable with some things, like scissor lips. Um, but just keep it simple whenever possible. Don't use it unnecessarily. So I'm going to go over methods of propulsion for robots. Um, you can use threads. They aren't very good. Um, 
you sacrifice speed a great deal with treads. And that they're kind of hard to kind of hard to get on your robot because they're difficult to change the length of touch tricks. So treads we we've never used them, they're bad but we use them. Wheels are just the overall best way to propel your robot. Um, there are multiple different kinds of wheels. There are, I think, yeah, sorry. Um, there's the standard rubber wheels for Tetrix. Um, those work very well. We've used those every year. Most teams use those. They work great. Now there's Omni wheels, um, which I will drop for you. In case you don't know what an Omni wheel is, I'll raise this for you. Um, here's my wheel. I'm a great artist. Here's your wheel. That's the axle. I'm so creative. Um, a standard wheel just has rubber or just some kind of um, frictionist material on its uh, circumference so it can move properly. An Omni wheel, but that wheel is restricted to going pretty much just forward and backwards. And if you try to like uh, pivot, it doesn't do that very well. It rattles as well. Right? So just keep. Um, Wheels have these wheels that basically it's basically a wheel inside a wheel. It's like inception. So when you pivot, um, like let's say we were going, this is the bottom of the robot. We have one of those wheels inside a wheel right there. And they're all around the circumference that I'm trying to show here. Um, that wheel will turn when you're trying to like pivot so that your robot doesn't uh, steer. So that's not new. Um, those are very useful. Um, like let's say you're trying to uh, make a robot agile. That's great. Um, if you're trying to be difficult to push around on the wheels to draw after them is that they you're pretty you're pretty you're easy to push around. So that's a draw. So you need to keep that. <coughs> um, there are other methods. There's ionic differential propulsion, J Tobo, but we're not gonna go over that. Um, that and those would damage the field. So, um, so I'm going to talk about direct drive. And direct drive is basically where, let's say we have a motor. It's the most simple method of propulsion when it comes to wheels. You just have a motor, an axle, and the axle is directly connected to the wheel. So the motor directly turns the wheel. There's no gear mechanism in between or chain mechanism. So the advantages of this is, like I said, it's very simple. It's easy to make. It's easy to maintain. But it's not always efficient. And right here, you're probably wondering why we've had this up the whole time. This is the efficiency curve of the standard uh, Tetris motors. And I can't really see it very well. Um, yeah, but, um, sorry about that. At around uh, 120 revolutions per minute, the motor is at its peak efficiency. You guys can look this up if I'm wrong on that quantity, but at X quantity, the motor, there's a specific quantity where the motor is very, operates efficiently. 128. Okay, 128 rounds per minute, the motor operates very efficiently. Um, if you go higher than that, we found that um, the motor tends to overheat and it, it's subject to undue stress. So that's not good. Um, so that's a drawback with direct drive. You have to, the best place to be operating if you employ direct drive, just motor, axle, wheel, is um, 120 rounds per minute. Um, you can go over that, but if, you're, if you do, um, you will stress the motors. And if you do that a lot, that can be the motors. We've seen that happen. That's bad. So, So how do we get there to 120 rounds, um, rounds per minute? You could revolutions. Um, so you could just always have the motors moving at 120 rounds per minute to get revolutions per minute. Um, but what if we want to go slower or faster? I could prove the problem right now. Um, this is where gears So we've used gears before. A lot, of, a lot of teams use gears because of this advantage. 
it's not very complicated. It's a motor attached to usually a C channel, and it just goes up, and it goes down, and it can raise the thing. The problem is that it takes up a lot of room because it doesn't bend. Then you can solve this by adding joints. So I'll pass this around in the middle, and this is a little later one. So I can move it here, but then I also added a joint here, so you can raise this. So now you can compactify it more. So you can add joints to fix that. The problem is, when you start adding joints, you lose this. So now, when you add joints, it becomes complicated. So arms, they're an okay way to go, especially if it's your first year and you're still trying to figure things out. It's a great way to just get started and to lift what you need to lift. Um, joints, sometimes they're easy, sometimes they're not. It depends a lot on your arm. You can pass this around just to like a model. Yes, Maggie? Did you ever use joints in any of the you've been in? Or, sorry, arms and joints? Uh, well, my team used an arm two years ago. That was our first year in FTC. And we had to raise racquetballs with the squad. And so we had an arm. Thank you. 
broad category I have here. Um, one of the problems is that most of these things are very slow. In my friend, this it's not going to go up very fast. It's very slow. And as you we were talking about like with the motors and stuff, your motor can only go so fast. And so these tend to be rather slow. Um, yeah, but other than that, the yeah, whole like, idea of a fourth lift varies a lot. Are there any questions so far? So now we're going to go on to the last one. Which is my personal favorite, which is bar linkages. So a bar linkage is where you link bars together, any number of bars. So it looks like this. And so you have vertical bars and you have horizontal bars. So you have something like this. And then you have whatever you want. The big advantage here is that this bar here, the final bar, something like this, this, this bar right over here with this attached to it, this is going to stay perpendicular to the ground even when I lift this up. So this will stay perpendicular to the ground even when the rest of it is moving. Uh, this is, we used this last year to raise these things here. So the way it would work is we put have the rings in there, and then we would attach this here, and then we raise it up, and it would reach all the way to the very top. Yes, sir. How is that attached to the room lock, and how is it driven? So, the way you attach this to the robot, so we had a tower at the back of our robot, and it was attached to the robot at these two points that I pulled in here. So, uh, one of them just rotates freely, and one of them is attached to a gear. And I looked through a complicated gear train, I think it was 18 to 1? Yeah, it was huge. Uh, a big gear train, because this is hard to lift. You would go on back to these motor curves. It made us very efficient, like gear train models <laughs> help us compensate for efficiency. Okay. Um, and then, so it goes through this huge gear train, and it goes back to a motor. The motor turns it, and it just rotates this one here which rotates the whole arm up. And so this can vary in size. That's a pretty big one. But you can just have simple linkages like this, where it's just short. It's like, this year you don't need to go that high. Last year we had to get up pretty high. But bar linkages are mostly simple. <coughs> the hardest part with these things is the gear trains. Uh, they are compact. It is a lot like a scissor lift. I mean, you can see the scissor lift in this, but it's not exactly a scissor lift. See, if it were this way, it could sort of be a scissor lift, but it's not. So it, it takes the compactness from the scissor lift, but it's more simple. Um, it's very reliable. We found this out last year. Um, it's just more simple. But there's one very important thing that is part of this. That uses something called lock nuts. Lock nuts, they're nuts and they have, uh, they have a little bit of plastic stuff inside. And so you, you, you put it on the screw and you tighten it and it doesn't come off. We put these lock nuts on here, and I'll pass this around. We put these on when we made this last year. We have never taken them off or needed to tighten them. They stay perfectly good. But it's useful for this because it's not coming off, but it's also not tight. So if this was tight, this would not open and close like it does. It would just not move, or if you use regular ones, they would eventually fall off because it's constantly twisting. Pass this around. So I really like bar linkages. I mean, we used this last year, and it worked very well. Um, the only thing is that it takes lots of years. Um, the only other thing is, while it is relatively compact, 
you have to place it near the back of your robot because it does stick forward a little bit. And so sometimes you end up with a back-heavy robot. Of course, you put it somewhere else, it could be front heavy. Everything you 
build your robot more, it should be centered around what your strategy is. Does anyone have any questions?
not use chains or belts in our drive train before, or in general. Um, I'm not sure how well it works. Um, I know uh, I know another team, not a first tech team, but uh, I think a Vex team that was at my school, they did use a, a chain and a belt, I think, on one occasion to make an elevator. Um, they, I'm trying to think. I guess this is kind of a, this might be a far cry because it's a different platform, but from what they said, it was very, it's not very reliable usually, but it's easier to make. Yeah. It's a lot more, it's easier to maintain. It's like, it's like a bike chain. It's like, we've probably all experienced this, like when you shift on your bike and the chain comes off. Yeah, I've had that happen. So there, it's not always that reliable, but it's pretty easy to fix and make in general. So yeah. those are some advantages. Because I know I've seen it happen before where there's a match and people's chain falls off. Like it's falls off one of the gears and it doesn't work. <coughs> then is there a restriction? It's available, isn't it? Because it is, yes. The key thing with the chain drive is make sure you have your tensioner idler designed correctly. Yeah. You can't just run between the same gears. I always have. I know, I know a lot of you are first year too, so I'm just going to tell you right now. This can get very violent. So if your chain is not securely attached, or something important on your robot is not secure, it may fall off when somebody grabs into you. So that's the biggest thing with chains. I've seen lots of chains where you can use that. And it works pretty well, but every now and then someone runs into them, and so they just can't move anymore. I know this is kind of getting into general robot design rather than mechanisms, um, but make your robot one robust, uh, make sure it can, like Diego was saying, make sure it can take hits and have shielding. We've Every successful team I've seen always has some kind of shielding around their robot. We usually use uh, Lexan plastic. That works very good. Um, or just having like a, a skirt of uh, Tetrix um, channels around. That, that works too. Just any kind of shielding to keep the keep the internal components okay. Other questions? <laughs>